we go. Welcome everybody to the big idea. I am Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, where we are going to be looking at little bits of research. Oh no, research is boring. Yes, I know it certainly can be, but really valuable information in there. So what do we do? We try to take something that's written like this, break it apart into its core elements, and then explain what that actually means in straight English for two groups of people. One, the healthcare providers who need to know this, but more importantly, for people who experience different kinds of health and health-related conditions so that they're able to find the kinds of solutions that can actually work for them. And today we're going to be talking about the relationship between the jaw and the upper part of the neck. And we're going to go through a, a little article here that, if I'm being honest, this one was really, really hard for me to read. I've been having to work on this one uh, at least three times over a, a span of many months to fully capture all of the, the details here. And so I will certainly do my best to make this as straightforward as we possibly can as we are getting the ball rolling here as always if this is a topic of interest for you we would appreciate if you would click the like click the subscribe and the reason that we ask you to do that is because it helps the algorithms find this video so that it becomes more available to helping out other people who don't know this particular kinds of information so what we're looking at here today the relationship between the dental occlusion, upper cervical spine, and temporomandibular joints prior to and following TENS, so transdermal electro uh, nerve stimulation treatment, in 36 patients suffering from temporomandibular disorder. If it takes you four lines to get through the title, you know this one's going to be a doozy. So here we go. Transcutaneous electrostimulation of the 5th, 7th, and ninth cranial nerves, uh, excuse me, nope, that, yeah, that is, no, 11th, 5th, oh dear, not, not a good start, 5th, 7th, and 11th cranial nerve produces relaxation of the masticatory facial and neck muscles by antidromic relaxation and hyperpolarization of the alpha-gamma motor neuron of the jaw elevator and depressor muscles of the head, jaw, and neck via the mesencephalic proprioceptor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. This results in concentricity and alignment of the atlanto-occipital, atlanto-axial, and C3, C4 vertebrae. What the heck does that actually mean? In a nutshell, it means that the nerves and the muscles through here, they're affecting the way that the upper neck moves. And as we show in this particular topic here, we're also going to show you how the neck influences how the jaw moves as well. So what's the crux of this paper? This paper was actually written by a series of dentists in the United States. And they're talking about how, and 100% appropriate, how the alignment of your teeth, the alignment of your jaw, affects the spine. So here we go. They note that the horizontal plane, what they're going to be calling a hip measurement, through the hamular notches and the incisal papilla defines the plane of the basal bone of the maxilla which extends dorsally through the atlanto-occipital joint and the upper cervical vertebral joints. On this hip, the alveolar bone develops to support the maxillary teeth on an occlusal plane with the mandibular teeth which in turn extends through the atlanto-axial joint at C1-C2. You can see how this article is so difficult. It's so dense in information. You're like, okay, what does that actually mean? And so what they've done is they have provided a picture. This is a side version of the skull. Here's a side version of the skull here. There are certain features on an x-ray that you can look at that basically define the upper palate or what's called your maxillary bone. It's the bone that essentially forms the floor of the brain of the skull cavity and is also then going to be the upper part for where your teeth attach, at least on your top jaw. And so what we and what these guys find is they find that if you measure these features and draw that line straight across, it's going to actually intersect with, so it would be like if I drew the line right like this, so drawing straight across here like that, it's going to affect the area that occurs between your skull and your C1, which is responsible for nodding. In addition to that, what they also say is they say that, okay, then if you extend down and then you look at how the occlusal plane, that is where and how your teeth come together. 
in a normal bite for you. That if you extend that line and you measure through where and how the teeth are coming together through the back of the jaw, they will find that that approximates with the plane of C1 and C2. That joint is principally responsible for allowing you to do this kind of movement. So there are these interesting and normal anatomical relationships. In brief, the upper part of the palate has an influence on this kind of movement, and then how your teeth come together has an influence on how your jaw, uh, excuse me, on how your upper neck rotates. So we will come back to that. So let's go ahead back to here. It will be noted that while the posterior extension of the hip plane bisects the atlanto-occipital, so that one at the very top joint, the parallel occlusal plate should bisect the atlanto-axial joint space from a physiological occlusion. In other words, what we just said, as the teeth come together, that influences that C1 and that C2, or in other words, that head rotation. Okay. Now... The eruption process may be impeded in association with an overclosure of the vertical dimensions of, occlusal, of occlusion derived from a variety of dental malocclusions, such as angles class 2, division 1, where the mandibular dental arch is retruded with respect to the maxillary arch. The pharyngeal airway may be restricted in obstructive sleep apnea when voluntary control of the airway is lost during sleep. This restriction may collapse down to a diameter of 2 millimeters from a normal range of 12 meter meters. But what does this mean? What is the eruption process? This means this is how your teeth are coming together as you were growing up. So as the little kid and into adulthood. And what they're saying here is that based on how your teeth actually come in and come together like this, it changes the relationship of that upper palate, and it also changes how the teeth come together. And in particular, what they're referring to with this class two division one with retrusion of the jaw, this is what's called, simply put, an overbite. It is where your upper teeth are extending too far forwards in your mouth. But really, that's not it, because different kinds of overbites and again, I'm not a dentist, and I'm not going to pretend to be a dentist in this article, but I do understand a few of these important principles because of how these affect the neck, and again, vice versa. Is that, simply put this, you don't always have to have where your upper palate extends all the way beyond your teeth to be an overbite. It can also be where your jaw goes backwards like this. So retrusion means that the lower jaw is coming backwards. And what that does is that compresses your TMJ, so temporary mandibular joint. Of interesting note, I have a lot of people who come to me and they say, okay, Jeff, I've got, you know, I've got jaw pain, I've got these jaw issues, and I ask them, point to me where you feel it. And then they point something like this. And you might note that my finger is located behind my jawline. Guess what? They're not actually on the jaw itself. They're actually pointing at their C1 vertebra. Your jaw, if you want to find the little bump on your ear, this thing here, it's called a tragus. And you put your finger basically right on the front of that and you do this with your mouth a few times. Open it close. You'll probably feel your jaw moving a little bit. You can also stick your finger in your ear. You don't have to put it in very hard. You see, I'm just on the surface. And same thing, you can feel your jaw moving very, very close in that spot. So appreciate then for just a sec that if because of how your skull bones and your teeth themselves are developing, that something happens that causes your jaw to go too far back like this. What they're saying here, and completely accurate, is that this is going to produce narrowness of your windpipe. That means that you're not going to have as much air being able to go down and then back up as you breathe. So typically what happens for people is they start to develop a certain habit of being mouth breathers. And that also in turn leads to sleep apnea. It's not, or uh, snoring, also certainly common, is if and when you're trying to get as much air as you can, but you've got that narrowness, your jaw can be a major component in that. And guess who that means? It means you may need to see a certain kind of dentist in order to get that resolved. But in addition to your airway, 
if you consider what we've just talked about with the normal relationship between what's happening with that upper palate and how your teeth to come together, how that influences your nodding and also your rotation area in your neck, those also can be affected. If you've got the jaw that's being shoved too far back, that's going to change how your neck moves. And we're going to get to that coming up right now. So let's roll ahead a little bit here. So what they are showing here, figure six, that is this one, presents the more common right tilt stick men following primary stimuli that are starred as descending and ascending varieties respective of postural anomalies. The uncommon left tilt to complete reversal is not shown in this paper. Uh, it is evident that there is reciprocity between the cranial mandibular, ocular, cervical, and pelvic planes, which are not strictly normal parallel to the gravitational field. In other words, when something happens with the alignment of your jaw with your teeth, it affects your posture and not just posture in this area, the posture of your whole body. And in fact, you can't disconnect the cranial mandibular, that is your jaw, your eyes, which also influence your brain's ability to maintain your upright balance, cervical, that is your neck. And think of your neck to a certain degree as a balance organ because it contains a huge amount of what are called proprioceptors nerve sensors that tell your brain where your body is in upright space essential for you to be able to stand upright and pelvic planes if and when you've got something wrong with your foot your knee or your pelvis it can destabilize your foundation and produce compensatory tilts going up blah 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 all of these components they feed into each other and they affect a person's posture and this is something I've talked about, you know, any number of different places. And we've got, you know, devices where we're measuring, looking at a person's posture. Why? It's not necessarily telling us, oh, this is exactly what's going on. But it shows that the changes that you are making are actually, or the change of the treatment you are doing is making a change to the global posture. If you're doing that, you're taking pressure off of muscles, off of ligaments, potentially even off of nerves. That's a good thing in terms of promoting health. Now, here's the cool part that I've been waiting to get to, and hopefully the, the rest of it's been pretty cool for you here so far. So Zafar et al., the other authors, used a wireless optoelectronic system for three-dimensional movement of natural head motion during jaw opening and closure, which demonstrates reciprocity between head posture and jaw function. It was noted that as the jaw opens, the head extends posteriorly and vice versa in jaw closure. In whiplash disorder or acceleration deacceleration disorder, decreased jaw movement accompanies decreased head and neck motion. Only anteroposterior motion defined as a cranial pitch primarily occurs at the allanto-occipital joints. This indicates that the shape of the mandibular condyles conform to the shape of the occipital condyles that protrusion of the TMJs may be cooperatively combined with the retrusion of the occipital condyles. Okay, 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 what does this mean? Firstly, normal specimens. That is you, a normal human being. What I want you to do is I want you to do this. I want you to take your fingertips and I want you to put them across the muscles at the very base of your skull up through here, okay? And you're not pushing very hard at all. And what I want you to do is I want you to just open your mouth like this as wide as you can a few times. And what you will feel, you will feel muscle activation in the back of your neck. And in brief, what these guys are saying, I'm going to over-exaggerate this now, is that as you begin to open your mouth, it all starts just by being able to relax the jaw muscles here. But in order for you to fully open your mouth, your body requires that you also engage your head like this. And I'm going to over-exaggerate this. In order to open your mouth as wide as you can, it requires that you be able to tip your head backwards. And if I have a model of the, the base of the skull, okay, so this is the front side here and then this is the, the side, what we're saying is that the back of the skull needs to be able to, as you open your mouth, it goes like this. So the back of the skull comes down and backwards this way. 
Okay. And vice versa. They said that when you clench and close as hard as you possibly can, that essentially is going to put the skull into this kind of a position. I know that's not really showing there, but the skull is somewhat tipping forwards and that top vertebra is moving forwards as well. In other words, you can't disconnect one from the other. And what they're noting in whiplash disorders, doesn't have to be car accidents per se, but anything where your head and neck gets snapped one way and then suddenly the other way, they are finding that there is decreased jaw movement. Now, what they don't say is they don't say, well, who actually started it? Because they've noted the jaw influences the neck, the neck influences the jaw. In a whiplash, I would look at it, and I think that there are plenty of other papers out there that do show this, that if you injure the neck, you can't quite move your jaw exactly the same way that it should be. And in fact, that's something that we see clinically, you know, most every day when we're taking care of people with TMJ conditions. But again, it's this idea that in order for one to work properly, the other one also has to be functional. Now, what this also means then in terms of TMJ issues, retrusion, does, um, Retrusion, designated as seating of the TMJ, evokes retrusive subluxation of the occipital condyles. I don't quite agree with that, but we'll explain that in a moment. It was demonstrated, as anticipated, that the wax impressions of TMJ and occipital condyles of 50 skulls at the Faculty of Dentistry at Edmonton, Canada, uh, perfectly conform with each other. For example, the medial pole of the TMJ condyle corresponds with the anterior pole of the occipital condyle. Thus, as the jaw is retruded by the clinician, the skull tends towards retrusion, which is opposite to cooperative physiological function of the TMJ of the occipital joints during opening and closing. Okay, this now gets to the heart of why it is that so many people with TMJ issues also have upper neck issues. The question is, is who started it? Now, I'm going to look at this for the sake of argument first. I'm going to do this from the dentist's perspective. And dentists out there, please, if I've made any error, and I know, you know, broad brush strokes, there are more uh, specifics here. But if I've made any very particular glaring errors, please, you know, let me know. I don't think so. But in brief this, you remember what we said about how the teeth come together can cause a overbite amongst other things. It changes how the jaw is going to be going forward. Protrusion, jaw goes forward. Retrusion, jaw goes backwards. And if you have jaw going backwards, if you have jaw going backwards, if you have an overbite, or even if your teeth look okay, but that jaw is getting bilaterally compressed, and I see this an awful lot. In fact, I'm pretty sure some you know dentists, they don't really appreciate me because they're looking at things from an aesthetic and they say, no, 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 the teeth is fine. But I'm like, no, they, they have compression on both sides of their jaw. Everything needs to be able to, to come forwards. If you've got that jaw that's been positioned backwards for whatever the reason, what it does is it's causing that atlas vertebra, so that top vertebra in your neck that supports the weight of your head, to misalign forwards. In other words, head goes, essentially, you get locked in this position. I am over-exaggerating it, but that atlas will misalign forwards, like this. Now, visualize, if you would, that if that vertebra has misaligned forwards, and you're in your quote-unquote neutral resting position, it shouldn't be there first and foremost. So you might as well be walking around as if your head is tucked down like this all day. Eventually that can cause a few issues. But if you then go to try to open your mouth as wide as you can, but you're starting from a position that's too far forwards, as you open your mouth, you're going to run out of real estate here, but it's possible that that vertebra will not be able to move back in turn. And if you have that vertebra that's shifted off of its normal center of gravity because of something in your teeth, and it tilts then the normal alignment in the way that your atlas should be able to support your neck, guess what that can do? That can produce compensatory postural distortions going down the rest of your spine. And this then is the important thing. What this is showing here is it's showing that a problem with your jaw can actually cause 
the upper vertebra in your neck to misalign. And now from my perspective for a second is I would be looking at a person, I'm looking for, okay, do you have misalignments of the neck? And I look at very particular misalignments, more on that in just a little bit. But it's possible that if the jaw is the primary factor, the reason that that vertebra is misaligned in the first place is because guess what? It's a compensation for the jaw issue. And I can adjust these people till I'm blue in the face and their adjustment will be good for five minutes until they bring their teeth back together. And then it will inevitably relapse back towards that abnormal position. And that's just the nodding part. Remember what we said also, they didn't really mention it here, but it certainly is alluded to is how those teeth come together. That influences that C1, C2 which is what allows you to be able to pivot your head like this. And there is a muscle that spans the C1 and the C2. And it has the most amount of proprioceptors in any area of the entire spine. What did we say proprioceptors are involved in again? Muscle tone, balance, coordination. So when this one goes funny, this will oftentimes manifest as vestibular issues. This will manifest as blurry vision. This will manifest as a clicking neck. This will manifest as headaches. C1, C2, I've talked about this in other videos. It's the grand compensation joint. Compensates for what? Anything in the entire body. And the jaw is one of the major players. This is the reason why. It's because how your teeth come together influences how that C1 and that C2 moves. So here we go again. From the chiropractor's perspective, we can adjust that, yep, you're all good. But if it's your jaw that's driving the situation, that is not going to fix the underlying problem. We are addressing the effect, not the cause in that circumstance. And that is not what, at least for myself as an upper cervical chiropractor, as a healthcare practitioner, that's not something that I am interested in doing, is just treating you over and over and over without getting to the root cause. My point here is that when identified, these are the people where I need to say, you know what, you need to see a very particular kind of dentist, one who understands this relationship, and they say, yes, I've got all of these symptoms here. That's not always where it's coming from. Now, indeed, it's very common, again, where these different kinds of issues can affect the upper part of the neck, and this is where I'm going to be getting to in this article next, the flip of that to how it goes the other way. So let's jump into that right now. And this is actually where I have to disagree with something a little bit on the um, in this article here. More appropriately, I might say there's perhaps another approach. It's not to say right or wrong, but there's probably another approach. This is one reason why this relationship here, neuromuscular dentists use transcutaneous relaxation of the cranial and masticatory muscles neither manipulatively restraining jaw or neck musculature. In other words, they put a TENS unit, which provides an electric stimulation essentially to relax all of the muscles through here so that those joints move properly so it makes the dental work better and easier. Thus, as the skull glides directly over the occipital condyles, it, tra it traverses the temporal mandibular joints from lateral to medial poles. The significance of this is that as the neck flexes anteriorly, as in forward head posture, like this, the skull extends posteriorly in paradoxical fashion to maintain the horizontal gaze such that the jaw joints become posteriorly displaced into a class 2 relationship and vice versa for class 3 with mandibular protrusion. Therefore, in conclusion, the various skeleton dental orthopedic classifications of the maxillomandibular relationship 1, 2, and 3 are intimately related to body posture. Furthermore, because of this interactive joint, sub, uh, joint subluxations of the atlanto-occipital, C1 and skull, uh, joints is um, accompanied by displacement of the mandibular condyles and vice versa. This was confirmed by studying cone beam CT images of the cervical and temporal mandibular condyles in 36 subjects suffering from temporal mandibular dysfunction. And then for the rest of the article, what they're showing is that they're basically putting the, these TENS unit, this TENS machine, on the various muscles associated with, you know, being able to open and close uh, the mouth. And as you can see, a few of these pads located in and around the neck, 
that they're, they're relaxing the area so that things can be moving properly so that the dentists are able to do their work. And they discuss then how the idea is that by stimulating the different pathways, because the neurology of this area that's involved just overlaps, it's located in the neck, and essentially that's the hypothesis they have in terms of how it works. But that's not really what I want to get into right here. I want to get into the and vice versa part that they talked about right here. And vice versa. We just talked about how the jaw position is going to affect the neck and how it's going to have a knock-on effect in terms of body posture and how the neck misalignments are not actually the primary cause of TMJ issues, but that it's the jaw. Vice versa means that it can go the other way. And these particular dentists, what they do is they use muscle relaxants in terms of a TENS unit to be able to restore that, you know, at least a certain degree of that movement. Now, I would then argue that there are a great many a circumstance where muscle relaxation alone does not work. And you see, if it was just a matter of you can do this exercise, you can do this stretch, or you can put these pads on you, and it fixes all of these things, there should actually be no reason for somebody such as myself, that is a chiropractor, to exist at all. A person would only ever need to go to see a physiotherapist. And this then at its core is the recognition that we are actually working on ever so slightly different things. Yes, it might look similar sometimes. And yes, we might be working with same and similar parts of the body. But the actual nature of our procedures is very, very different. As chiropractors then, and unfortunately, a lot of chiropractors are just sort of, you know, making movement through different joints. That's not what I'm talking about here at all. I'm talking about where a joint has been injured, not broken, not dislocated. But the consequence of it is it's essentially, it's gotten locked. It's gotten stuck like this. And there's a certain point of inertia where no amount of you doing your own stretching you doing your own relaxation, you doing your own whatever is able to overcome that point of inertia. And as a consequence, this thing stays stuck and misaligned in the abnormal position. If it's misaligned in the abnormal position, it also means it's not moving properly. There are certain movements that would you be able to do just fine. And then other movements, it's going to be restricted. And the rest of your neck, the rest of your spine may find ways of compensating for that, but that that very particular joint, it will not be moving properly. And I'm going to focus particularly at that C0, C1 joint between your skull and between your atlas. Because as we've just been talking about, that joint needs to move if you're going to open your jaw properly. So hypothetically then, Let's say that what's happened is you've had one of these kinds of injuries. You had that whiplash kind of injury. And again, doesn't have to be in the car accident, even the low speed car accident. This can be falling down, tripping on a curve, anything where your head goes whack like this. And as a consequence, then if it gets stuck and then you're on your devices all day or on your computer and sticking and lunging your head forward like that, it's essentially going into that misaligned position. And as a compensation for that, not only do you have your posture start to go, but it's going to work the other way. So as that atlas misaligns forward, it actually is going to cause your jaw muscles to tighten and to go backwards. And in this case, the temporomandibular joint problems and the tight muscles here and here may not actually be because the problem is how your teeth is coming are coming together. The problem is in your neck and it's going in and affecting the neurology and the muscle tone about how your jaw is designed to move. So in these kinds of cases, this is then where a person may be having certain kind of dental work. And yes, the TENS unit is going to help, but guess what they also need? They also then are very likely going to need the upper cervical chiropractor in order then to be able to get that upper neck moving the way that it should be so that the dentist's work can work as well as it possibly can. This is something I learned an awful long time ago. So again, somebody like me, 
an upper cervical chiropractor, that is somebody who focuses on the relationship between those top vertebrae in the neck, how they align, how they move, and how they affect the function of the neurology in that area, which regulates you know, most everything in the body, that the most difficult people that we will ever work with are people who have primary dental issues. And unless we refer them to the appropriate dentist, we are only ever going to get so far. But conversely then, the person who's doing the right kind of dentistry work, the most challenging people that they're going to have are people who have an upper neck issue. And they then, in order to get the best kind of results there, in order to go with the stream than rather against it, they need to work and they need to see an upper cervical chiropractor. And so far, I've just been talking about this in terms of binary, either or. Do you think it's possible that you can actually have more than one of these things going on? Yes. Because very frequently, if a person has an injury that changes the alignment of their jaw, it's also going to change the alignment of their neck. And I think you could appreciate then from a neuromuscular problem, especially as it relates to myofascial pain disorders, things like a fibromyalgia, things like chronic dizziness, things that slip between the gaps. Understand the possibility of what happens here. If you've got a jaw issue that essentially needs to make your neck compensate, say, go this way. But then let's say the nature of your neck injury says we need to make things go this way. Your muscles in your neurology essentially can get torn going in opposite directions. That's going to overload the neurology of this area, and that can lead to a whole bunch of very, very complex health issues. And as much as we would like to say, okay, yep, just have this one treatment and there's the problem solved because you go on the internet, you type in your symptoms, that's what's going to work. You're going to find it did work for some people, it didn't work for other. You're going to find some experts say, yep, this is absolutely what you need to do. And others say, bah, that has nonsense, that's nothing to do with it. It's because we're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about how two, at least two things are combining into a different mess like this. In other words... You're parallel parked in on two sides, and you've got about that much room on either side in order to get yourself out of this. There's not going to be one nice, simple move. Sometimes there is, but very pre frequently when people have the complex TMJ issues, it's because they have a combination of things. And therefore, in order for them to get out of this, it means they're going to have to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's going to be a back and forth process. And it can take quite a bit of time, as I'm sure you can appreciate. And it can be very frustrating. But I should hope then that this particular kind of information is going to help you out. So where does this essentially you know, leave us? I'm going to give you a couple little bits of homework, things that I want you to try for yourself, firstly. And this is, as we said, OK, do you have potentially the dental kind of issue here, or do you have the upper, uh, the upper neck chiropractic kind of issue here? What you do is you go stand in front of a mirror, okay? And if you're not 100% sure about you know, what and how you do this, what you should do is take a black felt marker and put a dot on the bottom of your chin. If you've got a little bit of scruff here, it may not work, but the idea is you can identify the midline of your chin here. And then put something here called the filtrum, that area right beneath your nose, and then put one on the top or part or in the upper part, basically right between the eyes. And stand what you think is straight and bite down in your normal bite, how you would normally chew food, and look in the mirror. So firstly, normally those things should line up like this. A lot of people, most people in fact, have certain degrees of cranial asymmetry. And so if those lines are not completely aligned, don't panic, don't worry at this point here. What's most important then from the functional perspective is what happens next. So what you do is you're in the mirror and you're just going to slowly open your mouth and look to see how those two dots here and here in particular are moving. And they may only move a few millimeters, but sometimes it can be far more pronounced. In brief, though, your jaw is normally supposed to open like this, in a straight line. If you see your jaw do this, go straight sideways, that is usually an indication that you have a maxillary issue, in which case this is a dental primary problem. 
if you see that your jaw does this, it goes zig zag, even if it doesn't come all the way back to midline. And guess what? It can also happen the other way. So not only when you open your mouth, but it can also happen as you close your mouth. If it goes zig zag, this is a neuromuscular problem. And this is oftentimes an indication that the problem in your jaw is coming from your upper neck, in which case you need to see the upper cervical chiropractor. The third possibility is where you have a little bit of both. It goes this way, but it goes zigzag. It doesn't come all the way back to midline. Or maybe what it seems to do is it seems to do a pivot and a shift, something like that. That's where odds are you've got both. And I know that that's not always palliate or is not always nice in terms of what you want to hear. You want everybody wants to have quick, easy, simple, especially as it relates to matters of their health and well-being. But the truth is sometimes, okay, we have more complex kind of conditions. But by acknowledging that, admitting, okay, this is the true nature of what's going on, that actually gives us then the opportunity to do something different about it, something that actually has the opportunity to work. And not just a matter of you know taking anti-inflammatories or muscle relaxants, but really getting to the core of the root cause of this so that if and where you can make those different kinds of changes, you're able to accomplish some of the best you know, long-term you know, kinds of things in terms of your overall health and well-being and function as much as possible. Now, people often ask me at this point, okay, Jeff, well, if I need to go see the dentist, what do they need to do? I'm not a dentist. I can't remark on that. There are all kinds, all kinds of different neuromuscular dentistry devices and appliances. The key is simply is that you're seeing the right kind of person. Firstly, who understands these relationships? What I can comment on is simply that I understand what happens in the upper part of the neck. If there's a problem there, we need to find out, okay, what's its location, what's its direction, what's its degree, and then how do we go about correcting that and then getting it to be able to move as good as possible so that any other work that you're having done is able to work as well as it can be as well. Again, you want to be swimming with the stream, not against it. And so those are the kinds of things certainly that you know we do and we look at for helping people with TMJ issues in our own practice. Not necessarily you know adjusting the TMJ direct, although there are plenty of instances where we do need to do that as well. But basically explaining you know how is it that something in the neck affects this? It's because this back and forth relationship. And again, if you go back to what we said in the very beginning here, remember that if I point to the C1 and then I point to your jaw. We're really talking about a difference of only one to two centimeters maximum. They share so many of the same muscular and ligament attachments, or at least they're very close to each other, and they seem so, share so much of the same neurology that you can't disconnect one from the other. You have to treat this area as a functional unit if you want to get the best results here. So a little bit perhaps of a, a longer uh, longer video here. Um, but again, this particular article, for as, uh, as important as it is, it's also very, very dense. There's a lot of information that we need to unpack in it, but one that I really hope has been uh, you know worth your while. So if you have enjoyed this video, we then ask you to do uh, three things for us. Number one, if you haven't already done so, click the like and subscribe button, because again, that helps the algorithms Take this video and make it available for other people who need to get this information. Number two is if you yourself know somebody who needs this information, family member, friend, please share this video with them because it's only by you taking this information and doing something with it that's actually going to make any change. And then number three is if you recognize, okay, hey, I've got you know something like this going on, and you want to have a little bit of a conversation here, or want a little bit more information, what we'll encourage you to do is to go to our website, which is atlashealth.com.au, where we've got a whole bunch of other articles, links to other videos, other research papers, explaining, again, how what we do in the upper neck affects and is related to jaw kind of function. So, Again, thank you guys for watching the video. Hope that you uh, not just you know found it to valuable information, but that you also actually enjoyed uh, the presentation here. So until next time, everybody, take care. Bye bye.